with it. So we appreciate you guys being here. This is our virtual summer institute for the Rural Life Nicewanger Foundation, and we are just pleased to have you along. And we know that some of you will be uh, utilizing this for some of your self-selected in-service. So stick around until the end where you can get a, a, a link for the evaluative form, and that will then prompt your email with a certificate that you can turn in. So I'm gonna hand it back over to Catherine, who is your beautiful host for today, and she will introduce our presenter. With the unruly puppy, so thank you for that. <laughs> and Tracy, I'm glad you're here too. So um, you're gonna be here from Brooklyn. And on our Zoom, if you don't mind, if you can keep yourself muted during the presentation, However, however, um, if you, we do encourage you to chat uh, using the chat feature. Uh, there'll be lots of times, I've seen Brooke's presentation and it's wonderful. There'll be times that she will ask you to unmute and actually do some talking. And when we go into breakout rooms, you'll need to unmute. But uh, for right now, and I see somebody's having trouble with changing their name. There's just three dots. You just hover the mouse over those three dots and you'll see rename and then a box will come up. And, and Catherine, so, those three dots are in the right corner of your participant uh, square. So like where you yeah. see your face or your name in that square, those little dots are in the top right hand corner. And all you have to do is just hover over your face and it'll pop up. So if you have any Zoom questions or tech problems, we've got We've got a, um, a cadre of good people here to help us with those issues. So uh, our session materials are posted on the Virtual Summer Institute website. And up there, I'm, I'm gonna do a shameless plug. We've had wonderful sessions and there's still some great stuff coming up. So please check that site for what's going on and just sign up for these sessions. Uh, you find your session under the day, time, day and time and then you can get to the materials, click materials and join the session. There's a link there, we'll take you right to it. It's very easy to do. Okay, so Brooke, are you ready to go? Yeah, so um, I see we have so many folks here with us today. So that's really exciting. Um, if you wouldn't mind just share any info about yourself um, as much as you, as you want in the chat regarding your name, your school, your grade, your subject, years of experience and fun. And uh, this says waterfall introductions and we were just all gonna type it and hit enter and wait and enter it all at the same time, but because there are so many of us and we are a little behind already, just go ahead and throw that in whenever you want to. And uh, we're just excited to see all of you. I see a lot of familiar faces out there and new faces too. So thanks for being here. Hopefully this will be um, a, a fun, time for you guys and you will be able to take some things back that you can use in your classrooms next year. And uh, like Catherine said, if you have any questions as we go along, please feel free to put those in the chat. We'll try to answer those. I know with tech sometimes a lot of things come up and um, they can be a little frustrating. So uh, we'll just all be patient with that and here to help. And uh, after the session, I will also be glad to stick around if there's any one-on-one -on -one help, like anything that we don't have time to answer within the session, because we are going to be moving through a few tools today. I want you to have some time to experience those, and then um, also uh, just hopefully have some time for questions as far as how to put those into use in your classroom from the from the teacher perspective. So, wow, so I see so many, um, so many people from... Um, from middle school, from different grade levels. We have just a variety of folks on here. So take some time and check that out and see who, who all is joining us today. Brooke, I even see some high school CTE people on. Wonderful. I'm a former high school teacher. So uh, worked closely with uh, some CTE people in, in my department at Hancock. Um, I taught ELA, but um, loved our CTE folks. So they were always a big support. Thank you. All right. Uh, well, so today, like I said, we're going to have lots of opportunities for hands on learning. So if you have questions or need help, just reach out in the chat for that. Uh, and just please feel free to share your voice so that we can learn from one another. I'm sure we'll be talking about some tools that you have actually used with your students this year. 
And uh, I would love to know uh, your thoughts on how those were best used in your classroom and just any tips and tricks that you have for others. So feel free to sh share those and let's just have some fun. So we're gonna be reflecting on some best practices for collaboration in the classroom. We know that collaboration was difficult this year for a lot of reasons. Uh, one being that we were teaching in a variety of methods. So we were online, we were hybrid, we were in person, we had uh, social distancing restrictions. So that was a, a big hurdle for lots of us this year. We're gonna talk about some ways that some of our uh, rural life teachers and just some research um, has shown to kind of overcome some of those hurdles and explore some of the virtual tools that help engage students wherever they are. Um, and then just collaborate with colleagues to improve practice, discover and share our um, you know, resources and new ideas. And we probably can't solve every problem, but maybe we can come up with some answers to some questions that you have. So regarding collaboration in general, we know as educators that uh, collaboration just helps students in a variety of ways, develop those higher level thinking skills, promote um, just positive relationships between students and between students and uh, faculty, helping with self-esteem, responsibility, teaching some of those SEL skills, like um, you know, having positive relationships with others, managing, uh, being a leader. So we know that in tons of research supports that uh, collaboration is good for students. And that's why uh, so many of us were a little disheartened this year when we had uh, kind of a more challenging time getting students uh, to collaborate because we know that it helps prepare them for those real life um, social and employment situations as well. Um, and also there's a, a great deal of research that's coming out regarding just collaboration in a remote environment. And I was able to participate in um, a few sessions with our uh, local, our REL Appalachia um, division. And that's through the um, federal government. And they were able to share a lot of research with us um, that really suggested things like using small groups, um, really enhances online courses, um, grouping students together based on like who's in person and who's online can make significant differences. So grouping those online students together. But I also saw teachers having a lot of success with grouping students who were in person with students who were at home and students being able to collaborate that way as well to continue that. So we're gonna talk about some of those things today and some of the methods that um, we saw put uh, to work in the classroom. And the first thing we're gonna start out with is Padlet. And I know that Padlet has been around a little longer than some of the other things that we're gonna talk about today. So maybe you've, and, and I've been in a few sessions already in VSI in which you have used Padlet, so it might not be new to you. Um, I just want to, to start out thinking about how we use technology in general, um, the value in the classroom and just best practices. So we're gonna start out with an um, activity called Quotation Nation. And you, I think Tracy will drop the link to this Padlet, but really you're just gonna have some time to reflect on these four quotes that you see on my screen currently. And just pick one of them that really resonates with you or stands out for some reason, maybe even that makes you question something maybe that you don't agree with. Maybe it just makes you feel strongly against it. That's okay if you don't agree with it, but you're gonna pick one quote that really stands out to you and you're just gonna comment on it. And then we're gonna have some collaboration and conversation around um, some of these ideas that are presented. So after you post your comment, please just uh, wait for others to post and then comment on at least one or two of them. And we're just gonna foster um, a conversation this way in Padlet. So. Um, I'm really uh, slow with learning this. So we post it on Padlet. Yes, I'm, I'm gonna open it up and I'm gonna show you how to do that. So Tracy should have dropped a link. Is everyone seeing that there? And please tell me to slow down if I need to because I decided and I go really fast. So yes, please tell me that. So um, when you join the link, you should see the Padlet here and you should see uh, those four quotes that were just on the slide. To post your reaction, what you will do is just click the plus sign. And this is gonna be um, really updating quickly because we have so many folks on here today and I've never actually used Padlet with, with this many. So we'll have to keep that in mind, but you will just hit the plus sign 
and then you will type your response. You have a spot when you hit the plus sign to type a title for your response. And then you can actually type your response there. And you have a few other options. There are scroll bars if you want to scroll up and down in this column to see what others are saying. If you wanted to respond with a picture instead, you could just hit this little magnifying glass and search Google for a picture. You could upload your own picture. You could add a link if you have something, a resource that you wanted to add. Um, but all you really have to do is top your response. If you want to get a little extra, feel free to do that. And when you're finished, it should just post there for you. I think I usually just click off over in an empty space and make sure that it just goes on there. And then you have the option to read and respond to others just by scrolling here. You can, if you really like it, you can give them a heart like on Instagram. And um, you can also add comment to respond to someone. So it's a little easier to keep those chains, those conversation chains together. If you just use add comment instead of trying to add a new comment in that box to respond to someone else. Questions about that? Okay, so I'm going to give you about, looks like we have lots of folks posting already, but I'm going to give you about four more minutes just to work on that and post your initial response. And then we'll take a couple of minutes to respond to others. Is there um, any way to like put a name with the, the stuff or is it all just anonymous? Now, if you are logged in, your name will go uh, in there. I'm pretty sure if I, if I post a comment, my name will pop up. Um, for students, you might just, and we actually had a teacher reflect on this, that she would have them uh, just add their name because uh, it is anonymous. And so that can be um, a factor that some people want to think about. So just as a uh, standard practice, just as a norm, um, she, this teacher said that she just required students to add their names um, in the title or um, in their comment somewhere. That's a good question. And while we're thinking about some of those technicalities as well, I will go ahead and point out that you can set up these padlets in a variety of ways. I set this up so that there are specific columns that you would post in. There are some, if you're using it more for brainstorming, you could just, um, your comments are just going to kind of go randomly all over the page in just different formats. And also with the free version, you are limited to three of these, which you can clear out and reuse, but you can't like keep them forever if you're wanting to do repeat boards. If you're wanting to use this, you'll have to clear it out and, and, and reuse that, which is kind of easy to do. Um, you will just go up to the settings and then clear all posts, which I'm not going to do right now because I want to be able to read all of those. But um, there are some settings here in which you could do that. You say we're limited to three boards like that, not three quotations, not three, three posts boards. on the board. So this, would okay. be a, like, this whole thing would be a board. So if I had, um, if I had multiple classes, what might have to happen is I might just have to like screenshot or document these responses in some way and clear it out if I were planning to use that with all of my classes and, um, and just make a, a fresh one for my next class coming in. Or if you wanted them to add to, you could just leave the responses on there. Do you know anything about the paid version? If it's like what additional features you get besides extra boards, if it's worth at, I, you know, asking for that? I, I haven't had the paid version in, uh, before, so I don't really, I did include a link to some tips and tricks. I think there is a help page. Um, if you um, search for pricing, it should show you that, but I think it's just gonna give you um, 
unlimited, probably unlimited or just a, a greater number of boards that you have access to. And it's in storage. I've looked into it too. It does a, a paid fee gives you your, your board stay a little longer. I put up a picture of John Dewey for FYI. Oh, nice. So it looks like we have some good, um, some good conversation going on here. Would anyone just like to come off mute and uh, just kind of talk about um, your response or respond to someone else? See a lot of people say imbalance is the key how kids figure out what they want to do in life. Um, I, liked, I, I like to include that quote because I like, but even as much as I love tech, um, I have to remind myself of that balance. Um, and I think Kristen uh, Zimke talks about this often. Um, even just thinking about if you're having students read digitally, then make sure that they're writing on actual paper or just striking that balance. Um, in your class, I think is important because like while we're doing everything with tech today, that can get a little overwhelming for some folks. So I meant to remind you to have some pencil and paper by you as well, because we're going to use that a little bit later. So, all right. Um, so any takeaways from this uh, discussion? Thoughts on how you might use this with students? Brooke, I liked somebody's comment that mentioned that the it was in the first column about how the teacher is the pivotal part. And uh, they said that the teachers were agents of engagement. I just liked that. So um, it's, and it does rest on us. And so, sometimes what we bring into the room, our feelings toward technology, our feelings toward some of these things and our familiarity with it. And it's okay to be human in front of our students, but if we're open and honest, then they pick up on that. And then they're open and honest and willing to try it too. So I like the agent of engagement phrase. I, I like that too. And I also like just how um, this person said um, that they use that as an instructional tool, but they still have to make it relevant to the process. Um, and so that really um, makes me think of thinking of not putting tools first in your planning, but really thinking about how these tools can support the best practices that you're already implementing in your classroom and the standards that you're covering. So um, that could really lend itself to a good conversation about how to use this tool. And is this true collaboration? Um, I would say this would be a step toward collaboration here. We are reading others' thoughts we are commenting on them. Um, it would be up to the teacher how, like, how powerful this tool could be used for collaboration and it, in what way would you, you want to use this. You could use it for if you have students in groups and, and they're brainstorming um, for a project. Um, there are just a variety of ways, and I know that teachers come up with all of the best things. So you guys probably have like four great ideas I've never even thought of in your, in your heads right now. Um, but just thinking about how we could implement this tool and the teacher is the most important factor there. So yeah, I'm really glad that someone pointed that out. Thanks. And this tool is really similar to the next tool that we're going to explore. And, at, and after we take a look at, and that's Jamboard. And after we take a look at that, I really like to think about how um, those are similar, but different and the, and the different purposes that they could serve as far as collaboration goes. All right, so any last minute takeaways here? Okay, so if you want to in your participant guide, you could just take a second to respond. Brooke. Oh, yes. Brooke, uh, it's, it's Linda. Uh, LaDawn I had, was talking, I'm not sure if she was uh, talking to the group or to someone else, but she's on mute if she was wanting to talk. <laughs> I'm yeah. sorry. No, I should have known that. Sorry about that, everyone. Yes. <laughs> you know, be out of school for a couple of days, you forget all about that. But uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I just wanted to throw in my two cents for what I do as a speech language pathologist. And I added the little 
comment about interacting with each other, but initially it, it's interacting with mom and dad. Um, I've had several of my administrators go, why are these kids coming in and they're having a hard time talking or they're, or I can't understand the thing they're saying. And when you, you know, and I have started to do that. I've looked at, you know, when you're going out to eat and mom and dad's on the device and then there's their, you know, one-year-old <laughs> sometimes it's early on a device. Yes. So I guess for me, put the device down, you know, get, go out there, make mud puddles with your kids, you know, read, read, read. Uh, so anyway, that, that's just my comment. <laughs> I think, yes, I think that's um, definitely important to remember that we need those experiences um, as well. And we, and we can get a little tech heavy, so just to remember to keep that balance that so many people mentioned. Um, thanks, thanks for sharing that. All right, so as we transition on, like I said, we are gonna look at a few different things today. Um, we'll just roll right into a Jamboard. And before we uh, take a look at Jamboard, we're just gonna watch a short video from Edutopia, which is one of my favorite sources to find uh, just really current and relevant articles and research that support uh, topics that are important to me right now. Um, and this video was put out, I believe it was this year, might've been 2020, it's kind of all a blur, but um, it is timely. It's talking about kids, keeping kids collaborating remotely and so we're just gonna take a look at some of the ideas here. And then we're gonna have some time to reflect on, um, and this is when the paper and pencil could um, become handy, but if you don't have that, you could certainly jot that down uh, wherever is convenient. Um, but we're just gonna jot down as we watch three things that we notice, just take note of. Um, you might notice a certain tool that's used or you might notice something else. So, just three things that you notice, two things that you're wondering about or that you would like to know more about, and then one strategy or tool that you used this year, or it doesn't have to be this year, could be um, a, a different year, but one strategy, strategy or tool that you used um, to keep students collaborating. So one thing that really works well for you. Any questions about that before we get started? So we're just gonna jot it down first, good old pencil and paper or whatever we have handy. And then we'll share it digitally later. So just FYI. Okay, all right, so we'll start the video and come back together when it's finished. It's pretty brief. And Tracy put in chat the three things, the the three, two, one. Oh, good. Thank you. It's easy to let group work fall by the wayside when you can't be in the room to ensure focus. Even for those teaching in person right now, social distancing prevents students from gathering around shared documents or devices. But using digital tools to collaborate can keep students connected, sharpen their tech skills, and support core academics. Here are five ways to enable your students to work together when they can't be near one another. Many schools already use basic tools designed for collaboration, like Google Docs or Slides. Ask students to build on each other's work in a presentation. Revision history will let you track contributions by author and help your students avoid accidental lost work. Ask students to create a digital bulletin board together to manage a project, organize information, or show their thinking. Tools that offer virtual collaboration walls for stickies or images, such as Padlet or Nearpod Collaborate, are easy to learn. Brainstorms, gallery walks, and sequencing activities can all be taken online with an interactive whiteboard tool like Jamboard. Breakout rooms can pose a management challenge, but they can be a great way to facilitate virtual discussions or small group work for older students while using a video conferencing tool like Zoom. 
keep students on track by joining random breakout rooms, or hold them accountable with shared documents. Harness students' enthusiasm for virtual worlds by assigning them to work on models together in an immersive environment. Many games, like Minecraft and Roblox, offer support and tools just for educators. Connect the project to their learning outside the virtual world and set parameters around which tools or materials can be used to avoid a potential time suck. Ask students to record videos to show their learning with a popular tool like Flipgrid, and classmates can comment on them or make response videos. Many apps allow students to reflect on each other's uploaded work, like Seesaw. Sharing guidelines for appropriate and respectful use of tools like this is key for a great peer feedback experience for students. Ultimately, the same best practices will help your students collaborate remotely via technology as anywhere else. Setting clear ground rules and expectations together, designating roles and scaffolding the basic skills needed, and closely tracking student work and progress. With a little bit of tech know-how, you can get your students back into a collaborative zone no matter where they are. Okay, so I know that, that um, as I was taking notes, I, I thought this, this is a lot to think about at one time. So I'm gonna give you just one more minute before we move on and um, add our thoughts to the Jamboard just to write down any last minute uh, notices, wonderings, or um, think about that tool or strategy that you found a lot of success with. All right, I hope that video sparks some new ideas or reinforce some strategies that you're finding success with. And to collaborate, we're just going to uh, share our 321 takeaways using a Jamboard. And something that I just discovered this week as I was planning for our rather large group is that, uh, and I'm glad that I found this out ahead of time, but on Jamboard, you are limited to 50 people on your Jamboard. So in order to share today, we are actually going to split up into breakout rooms, which were mentioned in, in the video. And I know teachers have lots of um, thoughts and opinions about bre the breakout rooms. Um, but we are going to split up into three breakout rooms today. So in just a minute, John is going to invite you to a breakout room and I'll ask you to pay attention to your room name. So it's either gonna be breakout room one, two or three. And um, Tracy and Catherine and I will be in um, each room just to, to help you out and to facilitate there. So we'll be able to re-explain this once we get in there. I'm breaking all the rules of directions that I just listened to a really interesting podcast about giving clear directions. And I feel like I'm breaking all of those today, but just when we get in, we can regroup. But um, what we're gonna do once we are there we are going to share our three, two, one takeaways um, on the jam board and just talk to one another about some of those major takeaways. And I'm going to pull that jam board up so that I can just show you a couple of things before we get in there. So on your participant guide, you'll see three links to a Jamboard. 
and you're going, going to want to follow the one that um, matches the room that you're assigned to. And uh, your host will also drop the link once we get in there. But we can't do it now because you won't be able to see the link once you move into the breakout room. So lots of things to anticipate here if you're using breakout rooms and links. Um, but I'm just going to open up one of those and show it to you now. And Jamboard is another tool that I know that we've used quite frequently this year. So you may already be. Uh, you may be saying, Brooke, I already know about this. I don't need all of these steps, but maybe we have some people who do. So I'm just going to go through uh, that very quickly. Um, so a Jamboard is kind of like a Padlet, but has a few extra features. Um, so you actually have the ability to scroll through to different frames. And that's here at the top where you'll see my cursor. You see one out of four. You can actually go on to the next frame. Um, frame two, frame three, and then frame four. So we'll be using four different frames today. And again, you just navigate those using those arrows at the top. We'll add our three things on a little sticky. So we'll go over to the side and we'll use the sticky note. And then we'll just type our three things. You get the point there, you'll click save. You can change the color. Yellow is my favorite color, so I'm going to leave it. And uh, you can move it around, drag and drop it, make it larger if you need to. And um, you can also add images. Um, today we're using stickies, but if you really feel the need to add an image, you can do that. And um, so then you'll just scroll through and you'll, you'll add your other ideas to the other frame. So two things you wondered about. And then um, one, this one's really important because it's going to help us on our next step too. Um, and also just help us share with others. Um, so we're here to just all learn from one another. That's the beauty of a session like this. So the one tech tool or strategy that has really helped you keep students collaborating. And if you have any questions, anything we've talked about so far, Jamboard, Padlet, anything else um, from the video, um, you can add that there. All right, questions about that before we Zoom away to our breakout rooms. Okay, so John, I'm going to take that as a sign that we are ready. If you wouldn't mind to just invite us to our breakout rooms, an invitation will pop up and you'll need to click accept to get to that breakout room and we will be around if you need any. Help. Right. So uh, I think we're all zooming back in here and someone in my group just asking a really we're just making a really good comment as we got zoomed out of there. I don't know if I left us enough time for that or not, but I didn't, due to my view, I'm really bad at seeing people's names right now because I'm looking at my slides and things. Who was talking about, if you wouldn't mind to speak up and just talk about that again, um, just setting the expectations and norms for using tools like this. Someone had a wondering about that. If you don't feel comfortable speaking, you could put it in the chat too. May not be back yet though. I was talking away muted, sorry. Um, oh, that's, that's Sarah. That's Sarah Reimer. Oh, hey, Sarah. Um, warning you, you may hear a um, child in the background. Oh, no um, problem. <laughs> Children and puppies, you're I, welcome. <laughs> yeah. So I had, I was wondering about what expectations and procedures um, you could recommend. Like I Googled some things at the beginning of last year and, and tried to pull those together, but I think that would be a good thing to discuss because I, you know, I know what to expect walking into my classroom and how we move in the halls and what our cafeteria procedures, like I know that kind of stuff, but as I'm learning this new tech, like what are some things that like, what are some things you would have in place for Jamboard if I want to try that or Flipgrid or things like that? That is a really great question. And Sarah, you teach middle school, don't you? I, I'm, yes, I'm seventh grade ELA. So it can be absolutely terrifying to turn a tool like this loose in the hands of middle schoolers, high schoolers. I think uh, coming from my high school background, I think about all the funny things that we could do with our pen and our... Uh, drawing tool and our po anonymous post-its. So we would definitely want to take the time on the front end to say, 
these are our expectations. So some teachers really like to make sure that they require students to add their names to their post-its. So um, that could be one thing that you would do. Um, I think even just having the conversation like, okay, this is a tool that we're gonna use that you guys know the expected behavior in this class. We know what's okay and what isn't. Maybe even just going through and reiterating some of those things that aren't okay. I think um, just setting those norms in the beginning. Um, would anyone have any, anyone who's um, used this tool with students this year? Because I honestly, I'm in clear transparency, complete transparency. I haven't used it uh, with students. I've used it with teachers. So um, any other ideas or uh, norms that you would throw out there? I saw a teacher, uh, one of my teachers that I work with, um, she wanted to use this and she wanted the kids to use it. And she just pretty much had like a citizenship talk and saying, you know, but if it's abused, we won't use it. Right. And we'll all know who that person was. And, you know, just, and it turned out okay. Uh, the rooms were always utilized with, uh, with uh, teacher assistants and things like that. In the middle of the breakout rooms. Yeah, breakout rooms had at least a teacher assistant in them. I saw one, I visited one school that used breakout rooms very frequently without, um, without having extra teachers. And um, that school was a really tech heavy school to begin with. And they kind of had this system going. It took a lot of work on the teacher's part, um, but they, um, they set up all these multiple Zoom, um, Google Meets, and they had um, just like all of the windows open on the teacher computer. So it's not for uh, the faint at heart to think about doing that, but they were making that work at that one at the one school. But I think in general, yeah, it's it's good to have a person in each breakout room. So they could you can be in more than one at one time, like have more than one up at a time. Is it that how takes they did some it, planning. Or? They set up multiple Google Meets. And so the students, it was a PBL school. So the students were assigned to groups that they were working with long-term. Some of them were at home, some of them were in school and they had their Google Meet. I think um, the student actually set it up and, and shared it to the teacher. Uh, don't quote me on that because I'm not hundred percent on that. But the teacher had all of those open. She had multiple computers and she had all those open. They were on mute, but they knew that she could come in at any time if she wanted to. Brooke, Alex Greer wrote a great thing in chat. I use Jamboard a lot in my class. We have a system email for students and mm -hmm. most places do. I, I set up the Jamboard where only students in our district can access it. Good. And the good thing is, is that you can, whenever you set that up, um, it will show their names in the jam board so if like andrew oh, moves something and shouldn't have or you know put something bad on it you can go back and look in version history or simply look and see his name moving whatever and you know deal with it from that point perfect i was wondering because on my screen i'm showing you here i have all these like anonymous krakens and uh loris but um if your students are logged in that would be the way to, to use that in the classroom you can see who's doing what um, something else that I wanted to point out, something that came up in, in my breakout room is that um, when I mentioned that Jamboard was limited to 50 students or to 50 participants, that's at one time. So that would be like live what we're doing right now. I couldn't have more than 50 people try to log in here or people would start getting a message. And I think some people said that they did anyway, um, that they couldn't access the Jamboard, that it was unavailable. Um, so if you have, you're not going to have more than 50 students in one class period at a time. So what I would suggest doing and what I did, and it was just real quick once I realized this just a couple of days ago, that we weren't all going to be able to access uh, the board at one time, is I just went up here and I just made a copy of the Jamboard that I already had created, named one, breakout room one, two, and three, and then um, just shared the links out to those separate ones. So you can make one for each class period that you have. You just can't have more than 50 people logging in at the same time on the same board, if that makes sense. Um, and Brooke, before you move on, there was a chat asking a question of Alex. So I copied and pasted it and sent it to Alex, but he's answering everybody. The question okay. was, 
do they have to be logged into a digital computer or just when they log into their email? And, it, and the answer was yes, they have to be logged into a district computer. If you're a Google uh, district, then you'll be right. logged into your district. You just make sure that the student with the district computer was in each group. Yep. Um, something else that I wanted to point out here, thanks for that, uh, Alex and Catherine. Something else that I wanted to point out is a lot of times when people, when teachers first started using this, they would create these things on here and they would get frustrated because students would move them around either intentionally or unintentionally, or they might be able to delete, like maybe able to delete my teacher directions there. But what you can actually do is set a background. So this thing here is static. It will not move. And that's because I set it as a background and you can do different things. Like if you're math, you could do a, a graph background. We have some grids here and things like that. Um, but you could um, upload an image. And so pretty much anything that you have as a Google slide, you could make any type of graph organizer or anything like that in a Google slide. And you could download that slide as a JPEG image and then just upload that here. And so that's going to be your background and your students cannot move that thing. You can also just, I just did a Google search for an image for people collaborating. Um, so you could do that as well. Um, but the functionality of the board is pretty basic. Like there are limited things here that you can do, which I appreciate because I don't want to get too complex. Um, but you could imagine using this for a variety of purposes, I'm sure. Um, something like this 321 activity where we're just sharing our takeaways. Uh, you could even take part of a text and, and download that as a JPEG, put the text on here. And if you're ELA, have students um, annotating that text together, collaborating. Um, if students are planning a project together, they could just have their own board. And I know that in Google Classroom, if you're using that, you can, um, I'm pretty sure you can add the Jamboards from your assignments. So you could assign those to um, small groups. Uh, math, I know, has um, come up with so many uses for this as well as um, social studies and science. So your wheels are probably spinning there on different ideas. And if you have a great idea that you'd like to share, just um, toss that out in the chat, please. Or if you have any lingering questions there, uh, toss those in the chat. It sounds like we have a lot of knowledgeable people on here. I think we'll go ahead and move on because I tend to run out of time. That was always my refinement objective in my evaluations was work on that pacing. And to this day, I'm still working on it. Um, but I'm gonna move back to the slides now. Thank you so much for your participation on that Jamboard. And I like the small groups too, because they allowed us to, to talk more with one another. I wish we had more time in there to, um, share those ideas, but you're gonna have a little time now to, I know my group didn't even make it to our one tool that we wanna highlight, but you're gonna have some more time now to think about that and to share out with others to become a star yourself on Flipgrid, which is a tool that you can use to facilitate conversations um, with audio and video among your students. And some of you have probably heard of this or even used it in your class before. I'm using it in a, my doctoral program right now. I have to uh, submit Flipgrid videos for responding to text. So that's fun. That's a lot of fun. I've been on the student side now of that. So I'm seeing that. Um, to get to the Flipgrid, you may either, and this really works if you have the app already, you can scan this on your phone. If you don't have the app, just due to our time today, I might suggest that you don't use your phone to scan the QR code, um, but instead use the link that Tracy is going to drop in the chat, which is going to take you to our board. And you're going to see three ways to log in. One says Google, one says Microsoft. They're very prominent. Don't do that. Don't log in with your Google or Microsoft account. Go down, and I'm going to show you right now when I open this link up, go down to where it says enter guest password, and you're going to enter our password, which is collaborate 2021 with a capital C all together, no spaces. So I'll put that back up in just a minute, but I want to show you what I'm talking about here for logging in.
and I'm already logged in. So it's going to put this right there. Oops. And log out. So when you go to that link, it should say enter your guest password right here. That's where you're going. Um, if you're using this with students, you definitely would add them a different way. So you would have you would add them with your school emails. It would be a lot different. But because we're all coming from different organizations, we're just using um, a guest password. And again, that password is collaborate 2021. And once you get in there, you will see our prompt for this activity. And you need a capital C. It's case sensitive. Yeah. Capital C. And um, so the prompt says read this article, which we may not have time to do, but you can skim that. Um, and it's just reflecting on this year what we want to take away and what we want to keep in our physical classrooms. I know this year was challenging for a lot of reasons, um, but there were things that we learned trial by fire that we can hopefully take with us. Um, so thinking about just reflecting on what's going to stick in our brick and mortar classroom. Maybe it's that one thing that you put on the jam board that um, that really helps you and your students keep collaborating this year, or maybe you want to talk about something different. But you're just going to create a really short video, two minutes or less, that highlights the strategy or tool that you plan to keep around. Just tell us what it is, how you used it, um, what went well, um, what struggles you encountered, or just any advice or rethinking for next year. Um, so I like to jot down some notes before I record this video. Um, some of you may be more uh, smooth talkers than I am, so you could just go go for it. And I also included two of our really awesome lead teachers, uh, Mandy B and Christy T, who made some um, made a model video. Mandy shows a great way of how she uses Jamboard with her, and she, she got all fancy and she did a screen share in the video and everything. So you might want to check that out. And Christy has some really great ideas about Padlet. But Mandy is an elementary school teacher. Um, Christy is a middle school teacher. So uh, just take a second, check them out. Um, try to make a and post a video of your own. Uh, we're coming up on 158, so we're over at 215. I'd like to come back together for questions if possible. So we're going to take about 10 minutes here. And that's going to be five minutes to explore either one of the videos or the article. And then five minutes to record your own video. Doesn't have to be anything fancy. We're all learners here. We're all we're all in this together. But when you're ready to record the video, you'll want to um, make sure that you have stopped your video and you are on mute on Zoom. Okay, so you have to go to Zoom and stop your video because um, your camera is not going to like to use um, two sites at one time. So stop your video on Zoom, mute yourself on Zoom and then just click here to record your response. Oh, and it's not going to let me do that right now because I still have my video on. So um, I'm going to say can't access the camera. If you have questions, please put them in the chat and don't come off mute on Zoom because you'll interfere with other people's videos. So we'll respond to you in the chat. Any questions now? dropped the link, the instructions also in the chat. So if you, you want to just message Brooke, me, uh, Catherine, we can kind of help you out quietly and that way we're not interrupting others. So it's a fun little thing that Brooke taught me how to use a few months ago and I learned it in five or six minutes. So happy hunting. <laughs> well, I put some tips on your participant guide too. And I just turn my video off on Zoom. So maybe it'll come up on here on Flipgrid and you can just see what that view looks like. But really you have some effect options if you're really needing to filter today or a pair of sunglasses I think you can put those on there stickers you just want to keep it plain and simple you can and then there are uh, lots of options on there so have fun and uh, we'll be in the chat if you need us Okay, so it is um, 10 after two, which leaves us about five minutes. So I'm gonna pull you all back now and I'm 
sorry if I'm interrupting anyone's masterpiece, but we just have some really great videos um, on here. So I hope that you will take some time after the session ends to check those out because teachers are sharing all kinds of wonderful ideas um, that they want to keep around next year. So you might be able to just pick up something that you absolutely love. And being um, part of the Rural Life community, I'm sure that um, a lot of teachers would not mind at all to um, collaborate with you if you wanted to uh, grab their name and try to reach out and learn more about um, whatever tool they are talking about. But um, I'm just loving these and I love the emoji faces and um, see some of my Bulls Gap peeps there. So hey to you guys, see lots of people, familiar faces. So thank you so much for being here today. And if Um, there, there are two more things that I was planning to talk about, and those were kind of the new things. So if you were here, you were one of those techie teachers who was here to learn um, a new tool, and you already knew all of these, I do apologize. But I'll just go ahead and throw out very quickly. I covered the three that I feel like are, are my top three favorites. Um, but Moat is a Google extension, so it's not really... Um, it's not really a site like the rest of these, but it is something that can be super handy if you download that from the Chrome Web Store. And um, all this does is it gives audio options. So I know that um, a lot of people are going to love this for accommodations and just um, differentiating um, assignments, but you can actually download Moat. It's M-O-T-E there on the slide. Um, there's a link in your participant slide a uh, packet that goes straight to the Google store um, where you can add that. And I know that different districts are picky about how you can add extensions. So you may have to work with your um, district tech person on this, um, especially if you wanted students to be able to use this to collaborate. Now, um, I've had teachers download this uh, extension and absolutely love it because they can go straight into a Google Doc. And um, my computer is being so slow right now. So I wanted to be able to share this with you. So I'm gonna to try to do it. Um, but because I have the extension downloaded, whenever I have um, a Google Doc open, typically I'll have a little button up here. Um, instead of the um, comment feature, then um, I can make a moat. And it's showing up on slides, but not on docs, probably because I'm in a different browser. But um, in Google Docs is my favorite way to use this, but you can just like record your moat, get started, and you just um, record yourself talking and it's going to embed that as a comment. It works on docs, it works on slides, teachers love it for feedback, but I was thinking to facilitate conversations around digital text or images, it might be really neat to allow students to use that on a Google Doc. So just a different thing than adding comments to one another for peer feedback or for collaboration, but actually um, using their voices. So when you add that as a comment, the, the other user can then see that and uh, push play. And it's just a verbal comment instead of a, a written one. So that's a really neat extension that I discovered this year. And then the last site is Kialo. And that's a debate site, it's been around for a while. They just um, created an EDU version of their site it's free for teachers. Um, it's really good for facilitating a really organized um, debate or discussion. So basically how it works is you just put a thesis up there and then students can put evidence or arguments for or against that thesis. And um, then they can vote on the best one. So it's really great to talk about strong evidence, um, logical arguments and, and uh, things like that. So. One and a half time for Q&A during the session, but we'll have to stick around afterward if you have time. Um, <laughs> this meme was like one of the funniest ones I saw this year about remote learning. Um, log into Zabblezoot, scroll down the Zork app and uh, go into Cracklezam. <laughs> Parents feeling that, thinking about all these educational apps. Um, you might be feeling that today a little bit because we did do a breeze through um, so many different apps and Kialo especially made me think of that when, when I read about that. So. Um, if you have some questions, feel free to stick around. Um, I can stay, hang on as long as uh, you guys need help. And I just thank you so much for being here today.
And I think we have a link to the evaluation that is coming in the chat. Yes, John has posted it there. So if you guys will just take that one minute evaluation and that will prompt your certificate for you. And this evaluation, uh, we really are constantly striving to improve. So we do, we do look at your feedback. We do use it to inform uh, future sessions. And um, a lot of the information that um, went into this presentation came from some of our lead teacher feedback. So um, if there's something you're interested in learning about, please put it on there and we will be sure um, that we try to do that in the future. And thanks, big thanks to um, John and Catherine and Tracy and Bethany for being on here to help out today. And anyone else I miss, Linda. And to all of you for your participation and all you do for students. Can I make a plug for Speechify really fast? Oh, yes. That's the one I commented Absolutely. on. Um, I'm working currently working on my adding my SPED endorsement. So especially thinking about kids who need read aloud accommodation. Um, or even those that just like, I use speech I, I, in my classes right now, I use it all the time, but you can upload most PDFs and then it's embedded. You can embed it, um, like that moat app you talked about, and it will read Google docs. It will read slides. It will read, um, all these texts to kids. So oh, it is fantastic wow. for, um, just like as something that kids have that option to let them be able, because I mean, I can think of so many, like. With Amplify, a lot of our texts are read to them, mm -hmm. but you know they have that option. But there may be something if I take them to a website or I give them a PDF, you know, it's not reading it to them. But with Speechify, it can. So I just wanted to plug that app. <laughs> awesome! Thanks. I'll check that out, and I'm sure others will appreciate that as as well. Is that a free app, or is it something that you have to pay for? You can pay for, I actually have the paid version. Um, mm -hmm. You can pay for it to have more human-like voices, but there are several um, more kind of digitized, digitized voices that are free. So that's really the only difference that I found between the paid and the uh, free version is the voice quality. Did you say that, Sarah, that was at Speechify or Speakify? Uh, Speechify. I typed it in the chat, too. Speechify. I think I put it right before the um, evaluation form got posted the first time. Okay, yeah, yeah, I see. Thank you. Speechify. Okay. Yeah. And at this point, we are um, hanging around. So if anyone wants to share anything else or ask a question, want me to share my screen and show you how to something up from the teacher view, um, surely would be happy to do that. Otherwise, hope you enjoy your afternoon. It's looking sunny out my way. Thank you, Brooke.